Turn to Romans 4, which is, in essence, Paul's commentary on Genesis 15, the significance of Genesis 15, God's promise to Abraham, and what that means for us today. So we have been studying here Paul's argument in Romans chapter 4. He begins by telling us that uh, that uh, the that circumcision cannot uh, justify anyone, that works cannot justify anyone. And so now he's going to advance that argument just a bit further and say so that if works themselves can't justify you, if circumcision is not the basis of justification. If indeed it's faith, then we can say the same thing about the law. And he picks up, we're going to pick up in verse 13 of Romans 4. He said, for the promise to Abraham and to his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, as it is written, I've made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist in hope. He believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That's why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus, our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Now, you know, it's hard to make a rational argument in an irrational culture. Uh, I think uh, more and more our, our culture is buying into uh, the fact that they, they believe that there are no absolutes and they believe that absolutely. Uh, that there is no objective truth, and the one truth they believe is that there is no truth. It obviously is a self-defeating argument. I want you to see the very rational, logical way that Paul goes at this presentation of the truth. First of all, don't ever lose sight of the fact that he's appealing to Scripture, that what he's looking at is what does the Scripture say. And uh, the argument that he presents is based on what the Old Testament says. Now, he's writing this, remember, keep in mind, he's writing this to the church at Rome, and the church at Rome is comprised of two different ethnic groups. There were originally the Jewish believers. I mean, uh, Jesus came as the Jewish Messiah, and so the very first believers were, most of them were, were Jews. And then the gospel began to go out, and Gentiles began to believe it. Rome which was literally the capital of the Western world at the time. It's the biggest city in the world, and it's where it was the center of, of culture, of military, of, of, uh, of power. And there in Rome, there was a church that had initially been Jewish followers of Jesus. Then Gentiles began 
being added to it. And then in around AD 49 or 50, somewhere in there, the Emperor Claudius makes all the Jews leave Rome. He thinks that there are too many of them, they're getting too much power. Also, Josephus says that, uh, that there, the, the clash between the non-believing Jews and the followers of Jesus Jews was coming out into the public realm. And so for a lot of reasons, Claudius kicks them all out. He says, get out of Rome. And uh, they're out for, I don't know, about eight years, and then the next emperor lets them come back. And so when these, uh, when these Jewish believers come back to Rome, the Gentile believers have been really making it just fine without them for nearly a decade. And so there's that inevitable discomfort of, of two groups of people, sort of the, the Jews coming back, were like, hey, we're the ones who started this place, and they've got their ideas about the way Christianity is the fulfillment of Judaism, and they see it as still inherently Jewish in character. But the Gentiles, though they recognize the authority of the Old Testament scriptures, and they certainly believe in the inspiration of those scriptures, they don't believe that a Gentile believer has to become a Jew in order to follow Jesus. So there's this inevitable clash between these two ethnic groups and also between their ways of looking at the Old Testament and the big question is, so does, does a Gentile believer have to become a Jew in order to be a follower of Jesus since he's the Jewish Messiah? And since the law all points to Jesus, does not a Gentile believer have to follow the law? Uh, because, I mean, after all, God gave it. It's a very tempting argument. Well, Paul is writing to this, this, this church with these two groups, and he's, he's laying out the case and he's making it very, very clear that justification is by faith. It's not on the basis of the law. It's not on the basis of circumcision. It's not on the basis of works. And therefore, since it's not based on the law, that the gospel is for anybody. Now, that's, that's the basic argument that he's making. And so we're just going to work through this text. I, I want you to see the logic. So let, let's look. First of all, he, the first part of our text today is a logical argument, a presentation of the argument based on Genesis 15. And then he uses the historical example of Abraham and Sarah conceiving Isaac in their old age to show that this, this is the response to justification. This is not, in fact, the cause of it. So look at the argument of the text. Notice the very first word of verse 13, four. Now, that clearly connects it with what came before. It connects it back to the preceding discussion about circumcision. Works don't justify you, Paul says. Circumcision doesn't justify you. So, now he shifts from the focus on that one deed of the law, that is the, the marking of flesh in circumcision, and, and now he's going to move toward the, the whole law itself. And his argument in verse 13 is that since God's promise did not come through the law, all right, look at verse 13, the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Now, this isn't Paul's main point, and it's not my main point either, but I can't pass over this without pointing out to you the way Paul is reading Genesis 15. When Pastor Chris read it a few moments ago, did you notice in Genesis 15, 15 the promise to Abraham was that he would be the, that he would inherit what? The land, the land of specifically Canaan. God tells him everywhere you put your foot, when you, to the north, the south, east, the west, everything you see, you're going to inherit. And of course, the Jews still look at that and interpret that as the modern land of Israel, right? And a lot of Christians who talk about the Jews inheriting Israel. I want you to see what Paul sees. And Paul says, oh, if that's what you're seeing, you're seeing it way too small. God's not promising Abraham the land of Canaan. He's promising him and his offspring the world. You're going to get it all. You're going to inherit with Jesus Christ everything that there is. His promise was that he would be, he and his offspring would inherit the world. 
But that promise was not made based on the fact that Abraham kept any law. First of all, no law existed yet. God had not given the law. That comes from, from Moses years later. I mean, 400 years later, that's going to show up. Abraham did not. He was not a law keeper. And so since his promise did not come through the law, it comes through justification by faith. Now, in verse 14, the next step in this argument for if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null, the promise is void. Okay, he, he said, so if, if only law keepers inherited, God's promise would be empty. I mean, it's not really a promise. I'm going to do this for you and your offspring if it's conditional, right? He says, here's what I'm going to do for you. You and your offspring are going to inherit the world. And if Abraham then has to keep the law, well, what kind of promise is that? That makes the promise empty. Since circumcision, uh, now, let, I sort of get, you got to understand why the Jewish believers think this. Let's, let's not dismiss them too quickly or easily. Since circumcision was indeed in the Old, Test, in the Old Testament, it was required for entrance into the covenant by Jews. I mean, if you want to be part of covenant people, you had to enter through circumcision if you were a male. So I get that it would be tempting uh, to think that this requirement would be necessary for the enjoyment of the promise for both Jews and Gentiles. But if righteousness is obtained by doing, Paul says then the faith is rendered futile and the promise nullified. That's, that's not really a promise. That's an offer, but it's not a promise. Tanya and I love to go to the big island of Hawaii. It's sort of our, one of our, our happy places. We like that. On the, uh, on the east side, what we call the Hilo side of the island, up toward the northern part, there is an estate. Don't look it up now. You can look it up later. It's called... Uh, it's called Waterfalling Estate. You know, uh, uh, there's a famous place by uh, Falling, Falling Water. Uh, was one of uh, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's famous houses. Well, this reverses it. It's called Waterfalling. How clever. And it's this massive estate. It's built right on this cliff overlooking the ocean. There's a waterfall on the property. Uh, it includes uh, its own, a nine-hole golf course, uh, a home gym, an elevator, a uh, master suite, jacuzzi tubs, a 32-foot high platform dive, a uh, two-story water slide. It's got its own helipad. It has tennis and basketball court with stadium seating, a 25-meter Olympic swimming pool, balcony patio. It's made uh, in out of dolomite uh, that's designed to withstand any kind of cyclone or nuclear blast. Uh, and they've had it for sale for years. Uh, I think it started out at $12 million. I think last time I saw it's down to around $9 million, uh, just in case you're interested and would like to let your pastor borrow it on occasion, uh, you, you can do it. Now, if someone came to me and they said, I promise to give this to you. Okay. But then I learned that, okay, I've got to make annual payments. I've got to pay the taxes on it. And I have to make the mortgage payments on it. What kind of a promise is that? In fact, it's a promise I cannot afford. If you tell me you're promising me that estate, but it's anything other than an outright gift, that's a promise I cannot afford. I can't, I can't, I can't even pay the taxes on it, let alone make the installments on the mortgage. The faith I had in that promise is futile because I cannot meet its obligations. This is exactly what Paul is saying. If God makes this promise to Abraham and Abraham has to do anything to become heir of the world, then, then that promise is nullified. His, his, his faith is void. And, the law, and as if that weren't enough, Paul says in verse 15 that the law, anyway, that's not what the law is designed to do. The law 
only brings wrath, not righteousness. If you look at the flow of the argument, verse 15 is connected by another four. For the law only brings wrath, not righteousness. It, 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 it doesn't bring holiness, only wrath. The, the purpose of the law is not to make you holy. It's, it's to control you. Uh, so Tanya and I live in South Frankfurt, which has been absolutely torn up for the past year. Second Street closed. Uh, it's uh, the main artery to our house. And sometimes they have made it impossible for us to get from where we park our car anywhere legally. We have to go the, we have had to go the wrong way on one way streets because they've hemmed us in at times and you don't know which way the traffic's flowing on a given day and they're bringing in equipment and, and you know, so uh, sometimes, uh, you know, I, I feel like since they've disadvantaged me like that, that I don't always have to stop at stop signs. <laughs> like they owe me. Yeah. Uh, now, if I come to a stop sign and I stop, I come to a full stop at the stop sign and then proceed, I don't feel particularly holy about that, right? Like, did that make me holy? Would you look at me and say, what a holy man. <laughs> he completely stopped at that stop sign. See, the, the law... Doesn't, doesn't make me holy. It can't do that. It's impossible for it to do it. What it can do is make me feel a little guilty when I don't come to a full stop, right? Okay. In fact, can I be honest with you? Sometimes when I leave early on a Sunday morning, for instance, and there's nobody in sight, I can look around, there's no pedestrian, there's no car within sight. I'm irritated by the law. Like, this ought to be a yield. <laughs> no one ever is, is here. Why do they have a stoplight at this intersection? There's never a bunch of cars backed up there on that street to get out there. Why, why do I have to stop? And, you know, if I do roll through it carefully, expeditiously, <laughs> I do feel a little tinge of guilt, right? Uh, the law can make me feel like a transgressor, but it can't make me holy. It, it doesn't add anything positive to me. It only shows me the transgression. Uh, and if there were no stop sign, I wouldn't feel it, right? It's the forbidding of the law that makes me feel the transgression. Now, here's where you need to know two different words. Paul's using one of them. The word for sin... Hamartia is not the word Paul is using. He does not say, where there's no law, there's no sin. He doesn't say that because you are born in sin. Even before you positively break a law, you're born in sin. Your disposition is sinful. We came forth out of our mother's womb speaking lies, David said. And uh, you know, we learned how to be selfish all on our own. We learned how to hit and, and take away toys and to steal and to lie and all those things you never had to teach your children because inherently they know how to do that stuff. You had to teach them how to say please and thank you and, and yes, sir, and to obey. You had to work on that because that's not their disposition. And that's not yours either. So Paul doesn't say that where there's no law, there's no sin. He says where there's no law, there's no transgression. Now, this word is parabasis. This means that there's a crossing of the line. You're going across something. God draws a line. He says, don't cross that. Don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And Eve and Adam both eat. What do they do? They transgressed the law. Now they've, they've crossed it. And the crossing of that then changed their disposition. See, what Paul is saying is God's law is, here's a York word for you, unkeepable. It's, it's unfulfillable. 
The law brings God's wrath, but it does not bring God's blessing. And when Paul, what Paul is going after here is this erroneous thinking that he himself once had when he was a Pharisee. And he's taught, he sat at the feet of Gamaliel and he taught in the temple. What's he teaching? They were teaching that the law leads to life. The law brings life. That's, that's what the Jews thought. And what Paul has seen now because of Christ, that's absolutely not true. The law was never designed to give life. It was only designed to bring the transgression, to show the need of life. Uh, keep your finger here, but turn to Psalm 1. Look at Psalm 1. Let, let, let's just, let's, let's see how it works. In Psalm 1, here we have this, this the psalm opens with this wisdom psalm that tells us the, the way of, of the righteous and the way of the transgressor, the way of life, the way of death. And look at the first half of it. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Now here's the question. Does doing that, living like the righteous man of Psalm 1, does that bring life? Well, let me ask you, who in the Old Testament did that? There's the description of the righteous man. Uh, and did David, did David meditate on God's law day and night? Was David meditating on God's law when he was on that rooftop and he looked over there and saw Bathsheba taking a bath and he said, go get her for me? Uh, was Moses meditating on God's law when he killed that Egyptian or when he struck the rock Contrary to God's direct command, was Abraham delighting in the law of the Lord when he went into Hagar's tent outside of God's revealed will? See, Paul is attacking the traditional Jewish view that the law leads to life. They're reading Psalm 1 and they're saying, do that, do that, and you'll live. What Paul's saying is, no one has done that. No one could do that. You read Psalm 1 and you go, that's not me. That's not David. That's not Moses. It's not Abraham. It's nobody in the Old Testament because the, the law cannot give life. And if the law cannot produce righteousness, now back in our text in verse 16, therefore, all right, Paul gives us all these, these statements Therefore, now here's his conclusion, righteousness depends on faith. Righteousness doesn't depend on keeping the law. The law can't bring righteousness. It doesn't create holiness. It only shows transgression. Verse 16, that is why it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed. Oh, oh man, that's beautiful. The promised inheritance rests on grace. What a beautiful picture. The promised inheritance that Abraham and his offspring will inherit the world does not rest on Abraham and his offspring keeping the law. If it did, then faith is void. It's, it's, it's empty. And the promise is nullified because nobody did it. They didn't keep it. But if it rests on grace, if God's purpose is to show his goodness and his grace instead of Abraham's goodness and Abraham's righteousness, well then that promise, that promised inheritance, salvation, justification, you could call it a lot of things, but it rests on grace. The promise by faith ensures that the promised inheritance accords with God's grace. God's not saying, okay, I'm going to give you salvation, but you got to keep up the payments. You've got to, now you've got to 
keep it up. I've made the down payment for your eternal life, but you've got to keep it up. And if you don't keep it up, then I'm going to foreclose and you'll lose it. No, it rests not on the works of the law. It rests on grace. And what Paul's recalling the contrast, you go back up at verses four and five of, of chapter four, and this is exactly what Paul contrasted. There's the one who works and his wages are counted as a debt. He, it's owed to him that he has to be paid. But then on the other hand, uh, there's the one who does not work, but believes in him and justifies the ungodly. Paul says it's only one of these two ways. You, either it's based on works or it's based on faith. And his argument is it has to be based on faith. And the promised inheritance rests on grace and justification is guaranteed. Look at the word. He uses the word guaranteed. Now, if it's based on you keeping up some end of the bargain, is your salvation guaranteed? Is your justification guaranteed if it depends on you in any way? I had a couple that was, uh, they were talking about getting married and they came in my office one time and, and they, were, they had reached a sticking point. And she wanted him to promise that he would be faithful to her throughout their marriage, that he would never cheat on her. And he said, you know, that's my intent. But he said, I just, I don't think I can make that promise. I said, really? I said, can you promise you won't kill her? <laughs> well, yeah, I'm pretty sure I can promise that. Well, then why can't you promise you won't cheat on her? I said, I make that promise every day. You know, I, I think he was wrong that he could make a promise like that to, to the woman. But I will tell you, uh, this is precisely what Paul is going. He's like, you're not just having to promise you won't commit one sin. You're having to promise you won't commit any. And if the promise depends on your keeping the law, you really have no hope of salvation. The only way the promise can be guaranteed is if it depends on God's righteousness. Now look at the movie makes now. All right, if that's true, if it doesn't depend on you keeping the law, if justification is guaranteed, then anyone can be a descendant of Abraham. Oh, no, that's radical thinking. What? Look at verses 16 and 17. That is why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring. Well, who's that? The Jews? Not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, as it is written, I have made you the father of the Jewish nation. Is that what it says? I've made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Now look at this. Here's God telling Abraham he's going to make him the father of many nations. And at the time that God makes this promise to Abraham, none of them exist. In fact, God makes this promise. We, I had Pastor Chris read uh, Genesis 15, but if you look at Genesis 12, verse 7, you'll see the first time God mentions, the very first time he appears to Abraham, he mentions his offspring. This is why uh, years pass, and you get to Genesis 15, and that's when Abraham goes, hey, you've not given me any offspring yet. And Eliezer of Damascus, my servant's going to inherit everything. And God said, no, 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 I'm going to keep my word to you. It's, he's not going to inherit. You're going to have a son. He's going to be the father of many. Look up at the stars. You see that? All the stars in heaven, that's, that's going to be the number of your descendants. Count the sands on the seashore. That's going to be the number of your descendants. Here's God's promise to an old man with an old wife who's never had any children. 
And the way God can make that promise is because he's not just merely, merely seen Abraham's physical descendants, he's seen his spiritual offspring, all those who will believe by faith. Now verse 16 shifts to another dimension of the argument that if it is because of grace, all people, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of where they're born, regardless of the color of their skin, regardless of any external factor, all people have access to this grace. Because what makes them a descendant of Abraham is faith. So you want to be a son or daughter of Abraham? Then believe what Abraham believed. And you will inherit the world with him. You're going to get in the line of inheritance, not through the deeds of the law, not through circumcision, not through physical birth, but through faith. And so in verse 18, he gives now a historical example of what that kind of faith looks like. And he says, Abraham in hope believed against hope. What an interesting phrase. Paul's using the word hope, I think, in two different ways here, the same way we do. First of all, he says, Abraham in hope, that is, in the hope, the, let's call this the assured hope, the way the Bible speaks of the return of Jesus as the blessed hope. It's not a hope for or a hope so or a hope that. It's an assured hope, a hope in. My hope is in God keeping his promise. So Abraham, in assured hope, believed against wish hope. You know, he, he sort of had the wish hope, boy, I wish I could be a dad. I wish I could have a son. But his hope in God overwhelmed the hope so. His assured hope worked against his hope so, his wish hope. And even though years passed, God first gives him the promise in Genesis 12. It's reiterated in Genesis uh, 15. Uh, and then years pass till he's now 100 years old and Sarah is 90. Now, I can imagine my mother is 89 years old. I can't imagine if I called my mom today, Mom, how are you doing? I'm not even going to go there. I'm just not, <laughs> I can't bring myself to say it. It's sort of gross. <laughs> we just can't even think about it. You don't want to think about this. Abraham could look at himself. And do we need to deeply exegete this passage that his flesh was as good as dead? You figure it out. And Sarah, she's post, post menopausal. She's 90 years old. And yet Abraham believed against the physical evidence. There, there, there's nothing in this scenario that gives any hope except the word of God. Right? There's not a maybe, maybe there's still time. Maybe we're not quite yet past the age. God let them go so far past the age that there's no question. There's only one word for this, and it's the word miracle. And Abraham believed against the visible evidence. He believed during years of God's apparent inactivity. I mean, he's waiting and he's waiting. And God promised him way back there when he left Ur of the Chaldees, he was going to have offspring. And, and now years have gone by and God says, and Abraham says, Lord, you know, Eliezer is going to inherit everything. And God says, no, he's not. 
That's not the plan. I've told you, I'm going to give you a son. I'm going to give you offspring. Look at the stars, Abraham. That's what I'm going to give you. It looks like God is not at work. But the Trinity's not meeting in emergency session. God's not up there going, oh no, Sarah's too old. Oh no, Abraham, his flesh is as good as dead. This isn't happening. That is not a conversation happening in heaven. And I want you to see something. That it says in the text, it uses the verbs weaken and waver. It, you know, Abraham did not weaken or waver or wane in faith. Now, I got to stop for a moment. Because we believe in the inerrancy of Scripture, right? We believe that the Bible is 100% accurate and it always is true. But I've read the Genesis account. And I mean, even when you read Genesis chapter 15, how does it begin? God, um, Abraham started complaining to God, Lord, you've not, you've not done anything yet. Eliezer's going to get it all. When God's already given his promise. I don't know about you, that sort of sounds like doubt to me. And how about when it, years pass, they still don't have a son, Sarah comes up with a plan, we need to help God out. You ever have those? Oh, I need to help God. I, I, I'm, I'm going to do this so God, God needs my help for this to happen. And Sarah comes up with a plan. You go into Hagar and have a son with Hagar. That'll count. We'll count her as mine. And Abraham does it. But that was not God's plan. That was not the promised son. That sounds to me like doubt. Yet this passage says he didn't waver. He didn't weaken. Well, what about that? How are we to understand that? Don't miss this. Here's the beauty of the gospel. That through the blood of Christ... What is it that God sees in us? Does he see our doubt? Does our doubt disqualify us? Does our doubt mean God says, no, no, I'm done with you? No. What does God see? He sees our faith. And though Abraham, to me, it sort of looks like he staggered. Hebrew says he staggered not at the promises of God. Again, why? Because the New Testament is looking at Abraham through the blood of Christ. And what is counted as righteousness is not his strength. What's counted as righteousness is his faith and the general direction of his life. Though sometimes he steps off the path, the general direction of his life is he's following God, he's trusting God. Aren't you glad God does not demand perfect faith from you? What does Jesus say? If you have faith like a mustard seed. I don't have perfect faith, but I have enough to know that God saves ungodly sinners like me. Abraham believed that. It says that he grew strong in faith. He grew strong enough in faith that he went in unto Sarah. And she conceived. And verse 22 says that God counted his faith as righteousness. Now Paul is showing us, here's what authentic faith looks like. Authentic faith acknowledges human inability. We're not, you know, we're not sugarcoating our condition. We're admitting our inability to save ourselves. But it takes God at his unilateral promise. God's not promising to keep part of the bargain and you keep your part of the bargain. God's promise is unilateral. I will bless you. I will make you a father of many nations. I will justify you. I will declare you righteous. He, there's no if you do your part. There's no if you keep the law or even if you have perfect faith. If God 
can take a dried up, childless centenarian named Abraham and make him the father of many nations. He can take a wretched, depraved sinner like me and make him a child of God. If he can take a barren, post, post-menopausal nonagenarian, there's a word for you, and make her bear a child, he can take a sinful, unrighteous woman and make her a believer who bears fruit. Authentic faith accepts God's perfect righteousness and trust in his resurrection power. If this God, in verse 17, gives life to the dead, and there Paul is speaking of Abraham and his dead flesh, but he's nodding his head toward the tomb in Jerusalem. This is the God who gives life to the dead. If he calls into existence the things that do not exist, he he calls into existence a people of God for whom he will give his own son, though they do not yet exist. He calls them into existence. Then this God will raise Jesus from the dead. He will deliver him up for our trespasses and raise him for our justification. This authentic faith trusts that resurrection power, that that's what God does. And authentic faith gives glory to God who gives life. See, if it has anything to do with me keeping the law or keeping up my end of the bargain, then I'm going to boast. I'm going to brag. I'm going to say, look, I, I deserve this because I did my part. But when you understand justification is completely a unilateral work of God's grace, all you do is accept it by faith, then you get no praise for that. God gets all the praise. He gets all the glory. And what the case Paul is making is that what was counted to Abraham will be counted to us. Verse 24. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead, Jesus our Lord. See, the justification of believers is future from the perspective of the Old Testament. Literally, it says in Greek, to those about to be counted. We could paraphrase it like this. Genesis 15, 6 was written for the sake of those in the future who would be counted righteous by faith. That's Herschel York. That's you if you accept the gospel. If God raised Jesus from the dead, he can change your life. If God raised Jesus from the dead, he can restore your broken marriage. If God raised Jesus from the dead, he can conquer your addiction to pornography. If God raised Jesus from the dead, he can tame your temper and your tongue. If God raised Jesus from the dead, he can take your dead, cold heart that has been antagonistic toward the gospel and has run from God's grace and rebelled at God's law and resented God's right to rule over you. And he can make that heart live with the throb of the gospel and your veins flow with justified blood and your mind think holy thoughts and your lungs breathe the free air of grace. God can do it because Jesus was delivered up for our trespasses. Oh, if you seek to make it about anything you've done, some sacrament, some act, some deed. If you dare to steal any of the glory from the Lord Jesus who went to Calvary's cross and God raised him from the dead to vindicate that sacrifice, then you fail to see the very argument Paul is making in every single word of this book. God can do it because Jesus was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. God raised a dead Savior to raise a dead sinner like you.